Hello, good afternoon, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, 28 for 28 webinar on the topic of decarbonization. We have an interesting discussion ahead of us today to discuss the issue of how are we going to capitalize on the technologies and the innovations on the, on the technical solutions to help reduce the carbon footprint of some of the vital sectors that we have. Today, we have a lead presentation by UNIDO, delivered by our colleague Rana Gune, who is the Chief of Energy Systems and Decarbonization Unit. And it will be followed with interesting commentaries from Georgi Gurban, the Head of Projects Implementation at the International Maritime Organization, Neil Dickinson, the Chief of Environmental Standards at uh, ACAV, the International Civil Aviation Organization, as well as Ivano Ilali, Inali, the Senior Sustainability Consultant of the Emirates Global Aluminium. So with that introduction, let's go ahead and give the floor to Rania to share with us her insights. Rania, over. Rana, over to you. Great, thank you, uh, Redan, and thanks for the invite uh, to UNIDO to share actually some of our work on industrial decarbonization. I'm going to try and share my screen. I see that the screen sharing is still on the, so do you want to stop sharing your slides so that I can share mine? Okay, perfect. Uh, great, so I'm going to be starting off by just sharing uh, some insights about UNIDO's work uh, broadly. Uh, UNIDO is not an agency that is uh, resident in the United Arab Emirates, uh, so I just thought let me start with an introduction of what is it that we actually uh, do and the linkage of our work um, to climate uh, change. Um, do you see my screen now? Yes, you might want to maximize it. OK, I'll do that. Um, great, so um, it is maximized. You should be able to see it now. So um, and let me change the display settings to. Um, OK. I think you should be able now to see it. Great. Um, so to start with, uh, I think UNIDO is uh, the United um, Nations we, agency. We see it along with your notes now. I don't have any notes actually. Yeah, with the next slide. So you might uh, want to switch um, to the way it was a second ago. OK, is that better? OK, that's perfect. Go ahead. OK, perfect. Great. Um, so UNIDO's mandate is inclusive and sustainable industrial development. And uh, so we have three phases that we see for industry and climate change. And uh, when I speak about industry, of course, I'm referring more to manufacturing uh, industry. So this is uh, the textile sector, the agribusiness sector, the uh, cement and steel. And so everything that is really manufacturing and having an, a value added uh, product at the end of the day. So there are three phases for industry within the climate change debate. Uh, and so the very first one is actually more industry being a root cause for climate change, being a key contributor for greenhouse gas emissions and through its processes and also extracting resources uh, inefficiently. Uh, the second uh, interface for industry and climate change is more industry as a vulnerable sector. And so there we see also a lot of uh, issues coming up, uh, particularly in developing countries where we see that there's quite a lot of loss and damage in infrastructure, as well as in some cases, you know, uh, uh, delayed access to some of the resources and inputs that industries uh, need. Uh, let's look at the agribusiness sector, for example. This is an area where sometimes some of the crops are being affected and as such really there is also an influence for industries that are in this sector to produce the goods that we are actually used to. And the third uh, phase uh, for industry is more of uh, industry being a solution provider a hero, if you like, providing the innovative technologies and business models that we need to actually drive and support a just uh, transition. Uh, today, uh, and uh, for the purpose of this uh, uh, webinar, we're going to focus actually on industrial decarbonization. And I wanted, so that's the part of the first role. And I wanted to put a spotlight on an initiative that UNIDO uh, leads uh, within the Clean Energy Ministerial, which is the Industrial Deep Decarbonization. Decarbonization initiative. 
Now, to start with, I mean, why are we talking about industrial decarbonization? Of course, uh, there, the, the fact that industry is an engine for economic growth, and it's also one of the largest sources of uh, emissions, uh, with more than one third of the global emissions coming from the industrial and manufacturing uh, sector. So if we want to get our climate change goals uh, right, then we need to particularly look into the sector. Um, if we dive uh, an inch deeper and we look at so what within the industrial sector or which subsectors within the industrial sectors account for the highest contribution of the global uh, emissions. Uh, we see that steel, chemicals, cement, concrete, aluminum, and also the refining industries account for 70% of the total uh, global industrial emissions. And if we look at steel, cement and concrete alone, that is actually around 14 to 16% of the global CO2 emissions. So that on its own is a very big uh, opportunity for us to reduce emissions from the industrial sector and contribute to uh, reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. Now, at the same time, uh, there are very distinct challenges that these sectors face. Uh, so when we talk about steel, cement and concrete decarbonization, uh, to start with, uh, you know, and, and maybe most of you must be already aware of discussions around hydrogen, around carbon capture uh, being key technologies now to support the industrial decarbonization. Uh, however, the way I like to frame this is actually that the technology availability and readiness is really the issue for these sectors. Um, so what we know is that before the Paris Agreement was uh, uh, agreed on, uh, we have energy efficiency and renewable energy primarily as the main pathways for reducing greenhouse gas emissions in industry. But if we want to keep within the 1.5 degrees uh, scenario, that alone is not enough. And so what we see is that actually for these industrial sectors, one of the key challenges is that the electrification of heat processes within these industries is a challenge. And there, there is certainly a scope for uh, driving more innovation in the electrification of heat. Uh, the second is actually the fact that technologies like CCUS and, and hydrogen are not yet fully commercialized. And so you re we really need to push for larger demonstration projects and to see also what these projects mean and how are they implemented in different regions and, and how they, do they need to be adapted also to the needs of industries in different uh, regions. And the third one is although we have an, an renewable energy applications in industry and energy efficiency are already well proven, they're not deployed neither fast enough nor deep enough. And so for us to get towards industrial decarbonization, we need to push along these three levers. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, a very big issue uh, is the financing. So, you know, the cost of conversion to green hydrogen uh, is quite significant. Um, so, you know, how, how do we mobilize all of this financing? But also, how do we, um, you know, uh, also make use of this opportunity that in many cases we are looking at uh, boilers that need replacement today? So how do we make sure that industries that need to replace these boilers are transitioning to towards low carbon and near zero uh, emission uh, technologies rather than investing in old technologies that will turn out to be stranded assets. Uh, the third challenge is actually the data availability and disclosure. Uh, at the moment, you know, if you go and you want to buy um, a one kilogram of uh, uh, steel or cement, uh, it's not really at the moment captured the embodied carbon that is uh, contained in this product. And even if it is, there is actually an issue of the harmonization of the standards that are used for measuring these products. So, you know, there we really need to uh, work globally on more collaboration and more harmonization across issues related to data availability, uh, standards, and comparability of these standards, but also looking at the same sources of data whenever we are verifying these standards. 
Um, and then finally, one of the last challenges is actually policies. Uh, many of the developed countries already have clear policies for the industrial sectors, clear roadmaps for uh, the targets that they have from now until 2040, 2050, uh, and, and, and also have very clear incentive uh, mechanisms that have been uh, set up. So if we look into the Inflation Reduction Act that the US has uh, put in place, you know, it includes quite a lot of incentives that are being given for local industries to uh, support that shift. So do we have the same resources when we look at emerging and developing countries? That is uh, certainly a, a big question mark at the moment. Um, enough about challenges, so let me tell you more about like now the solution that we are working on within the Industrial Deep Decarbonization Initiative. So this is actually a government-led initiative where uh, we have a quite a big and diverse coalition of private sector think tanks and organizations as well as governments working together uh, on the decarbonization of steel, cement and concrete. Um, within the initiative, we have already eight countries that are uh, on board including uh, the UAE. Uh, we work on uh, three within three working groups and bring more than 70 organizations and uh, uh, think tanks and academia that are really working collectively on uh, addressing some of the challenges that I have outlined. So what are the challenges that we decided to focus on uh, within the initiative? So the initiative aims at creating thriving markets for low carbon steel, low carbon cement, by addressing um, two key gap areas, which are the data and standards, as well as uh, green public procurement policy. Uh, why green public procurement? Essentially, uh, to go back to this issue of costs, the cost is quite high uh, upstream, but then when we look at the cost uh, downstream on the product level, uh, the cost is less than 1% of an added uh, uh, cost on a product. So just to give you an example, you know, if we're buying a car that's $20,000, uh, it's a $100 uh, addition on the cost of a car to actually go towards the green steel uh, option. Uh, if you're looking into the construction of a household uh, in the European Union of half a million uh, euro, we're looking at the cost of around 2,000 euros extra to the cost of that uh, house household. So this is why pulling these demand levers by large users, including uh, governments, is quite an effective way to create demand and create transparency for the industries in terms of uh, the demand for the products that they would be uh, producing and a signal that someone is actually willing to pay that green premium that they would be uh, interested in. So these are the three pillars of our work, uh, uh, the data and, and standards, the uh, and, and then in terms of the green procurement, uh, there what we are aiming at is creating uh, political will uh, and commitments from governments to procure uh, green steel and green cement and concrete. Uh, and I'll uh, mention to you essentially uh, what uh, we are trying to do within that. Um, now, if we look uh, a bit deeper into the issues related to standards, uh, what we see is that there is at the moment a wealth of uh, standards that are surfacing. We hear of ArcelorMetal starting its own standards. There is Responsible Steel, which is a standard put together by a, a coalition of, uh, of partners. Uh, we have you know, different standards uh, applied also by uh, movements related to green procurement, such as I mean, our own IDDI, but also the First Movers Coalition. So that's all uh, well and good. I think essentially we're all trying to push for the same thing. But at the end of the day, what matters is that we have a common understanding and framework uh, that compares how these different standards are used and that we define near zero and net zero and low carbon. You know, we have similar definitions and agree on certain bandwidths for uh, this uh, consumption. Now, uh, we also need to uh, complement that with uh, reporting uh, mechanisms. So you might be familiar with the environmental product declarations, the EPDs and, uh, and, and, and 
and as such also the life cycle assessments which need to look into um, the carbon footprint of a product along different uh, scopes of emissions and so this is where we are at the moment within uh, the industrial deep decarbonization driving harmonization. And uh, we have been mandated, in fact, by the Steel Breakthrough, uh, which is uh, part of the Glasgow Breakthrough that uh, the COP26 team had uh, put together. And I, I know that actually also within the COP28 team, they also look at the breakthrough agenda as a main delivery mechanism for a lot of the climate action. So there, uh, our uh, promise, in a sense, is to come to COP28 with uh, at least uh, some sort of a framework that allows for for the comparability of these different standards. So while heterogeneity or like uh, multiple standards are important, uh, at the end of the day, what's important is also we're uh, comparing them in the right way and we're measuring them in the uh, using the same methodology. So this is at the moment what we are working on together with uh, Responsible Steel. Um, with regards to uh, green procurement, uh, I mentioned the fact that the cost is uh, lower downstream on the product, but why did we choose also particularly green public procurement? Uh, in the countries that are supported by the initiative, what uh, our data shows us that actually governments pay uh, or are contributing to around 25 to 40 percent of uh, the procurement of uh, steel cement and concrete uh, primarily for public construction projects so this is quite a big size you know one fourth to almost half of the uh, demand for these products is coming from uh, governments however what we realize as well is that you know the uh, there, there there are some challenges there in terms of the uh, actual quantity quantification of these numbers so you know the you know government buys a project they don't buy the material so one of the things that we are working on at the moment is looking into the quantification of uh, the the quantities that are bought for these projects and trying to have a more in-depth analysis on the role that this uh, procurement could actually uh, drive um, I, I in terms of what this is, so what are we advocating for um, governments to uh, commit to? Uh, first and foremost, uh, we uh, need better data. We need governments to require the disclosure for the embodied carbon on public construction projects. Uh, and so the first tier of the pledge that we have launched at COP26 is for governments to require this disclosure of embodied carbon on public construction projects. Uh, the second uh, uh, ambition is actually the requirement for governments to align procurement targets with net zero targets. Uh, and, you know, this is an issue that we see more and more. Uh, there are net zero targets, but then when you come into translating that at the national level, you know, industrial policy might not be aligned with that. A procurement policy might not be aligned with that. And so we need to push for this policy coherence. Um, and ensure that the targets at the end of the day are aligned with the net zero goals. So we have there uh, Germany, uh, UK, uh, India, uh, as well as Canada that have committed to these two levels of ambition. Uh, and last year, uh, just ahead of COP27, we uh, and after a lot of consultation with our members, we launched the next two tiers of ambition, uh, which are actually commitments from uh, governments to procure low carbon uh, steel by 2030 uh, and near zero steel uh, uh, by uh, 2030, but on signature projects. Now, what does that mean? I mean, also just to make sure that we have the same understanding of what net zero and what near zero means. Um, so near zero is this super innovative technologies that we are looking at, uh, you know, that uh, are bringing us uh, significant reductions and closer to the uh, goals of the Paris agreements. Net zero is more about some of the technologies that we already have in place. So we're talking more about, you know, maybe CCUS and hydrogen and the likes, whereas for the near zero, we're looking into some new and breakthrough technologies that would be there. Um, with that, I thought it would also be interesting to mention that, of course, uh, while we focus on the public procurement, uh, there are also some other initiatives that focus on uh, uh, 
pri private procurement, so procurement by uh, private actors. Uh, and there we have the First Movers Coalition, uh, which is a coalition that was launched by the World Economic Forum in cooperation with uh, the US. Uh, and uh, so there, you, as you can see here, perhaps it explains a bit better this idea of the near zero. So what we're what the FMC is looking at is really high high impact, low volume uh, of uh, the project. Product, whereas what we are looking at is maybe slightly le less ambition, but then bigger, uh, bigger volumes and targeting the public sector. Steel Zero on the other side, which is also another uh, uh, campaign that is run by the climate group, is targeting these bigger volumes, bigger uh, uh, um, uh, ambition or lower ambition, bigger volumes, and uh, primarily looking at the private sector. So when we're talking about private sector, you know, we're talking about also commitments made by companies like Amazon and, and BMW and Volvo and, and, and many others. Now, with regards to the public sector, um, what we have at the moment is Germany, Canada and the UK, which have agreed to undertake national consultations and they should be coming to COP28 uh, with some commitments on the uh, level uh, of procurement that they are going to uh, uh, announce. Uh, so we're very hopeful and, and I mean, I think we really would like to see more and more countries that are joining uh, that effort. Um, I think in the in the interest of time, I mean, these are like more details around what we what we plan to do also for this year. But I mean, I'm happy to share uh, the slides to be circulated later. Uh, one thing I wanted to also perhaps uh, uh, end on here and 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 try to. Um, leave some reflections as well on you know what do we look out to cop 28 to achieve on this and 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 how can we continue to influence the global discourse on industrial decarbonization uh, I think first and foremost, uh, what we see is that maybe industrial decarbonization is not necessarily very uh, much uh, captured uh, within the discussions of uh, the, the COP. And so we would really like to see how we could use the global stock take to have a stronger relevance of industrial decarbonization within the uh, COP negotiations and discussions. Uh, in that, uh, you know, we are convening our own Vienna Energy forum in June um, this year and uh, we hope that uh, we can actually provide that input to the global stock take and bring that into the uh, COP28. Um, the other uh, point we also look to the UAE leadership on is uh, in fact that you know, many of these projects that we are talking about at the moment are are in the north, uh, and we really need to bring in stronger uh, perspectives from the global south, from uh, India, and from other countries uh, to uh, see what their needs as well on industrial decarbonization are, and and how can they effectively uh, achieve uh, decarbonization and net zero uh, sooner than the dates also that have been announced. And there, we certainly see an opportunity for the G20, which is at the moment chaired by India, and then it will be followed by Brazil and South Africa. And we are working with the Indian uh, G20 presidency on putting uh, forward an industrial decarbonization agenda uh, for the G20. Um, uh, another area is supporting building consensus around the topic of data and standards. It would be, uh, you know, something that we are working on and it would be great to, to have a bigger commitment uh, from uh, the COP28 uh, team and from the UAE to support that. Uh, we need to rally more governments around uh, committing to the procurement pledge and uh, you know we look forward to work with uh, UAE on bringing that to COP28 and finally uh, you know there there are issues also related to um, the skills that are needed uh, for this transition for this industrial transformation and that we really want to make sure that this um, transition is done in a just way uh, bringing uh, women and youth also on board equally um, there's a lot more uh, and uh, that's why I say, you know, the race continues, uh, you know, in line with this race to see a zero. There's a lot more that we need to do, but uh, from our side, these are priorities that we have set for ourselves and uh, for COP28 and that we would be very happy to work with the 
COP28 presidency on. Um, so thank you so much. And uh, with that, I'll turn back uh, maybe over to you, uh, Raidan, for the rest of the panel. Thank you very much, Rana, for that enlightening presentation. And colleagues, if you've missed in some issues, this is recorded. You can always go back to YouTube and click pause on any of the slides that you like and also engage further. Rana, you touched on a number of very important concepts, the spectrum of efforts that are required to decarbonize, particularly the, the hard to abate sectors. It is indeed a race and there are multiple measures, but I think we have uh, good chances with the advancements of technology and the perseverance that we see to make some meaningful progress. Um, there was just one point that you touched on in relation to carbon markets in Article 6.2, 6.4. I'd like to advise colleagues that we have an upcoming webinar on uh, innovative financing in May, I believe, which will touch on those issues uh, on that. So before moving forward, giving the floor to Georgi Gurban from uh, IMO, I'd like to invite all colleagues who have any questions, any thoughts to do so in the chat. Georgi, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much also for the invitation and I'm sorry for my voice. I, I have a bit of a cold, um, but I will be more than happy to share with you uh, the efforts and uh, a bit more also in general about IMO. Um, I hope you can see my slide. Yes, we do. Thank you. Um, so maybe just to start with, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with the International Maritime Organization, we are the leading UN agency addressing maritime regu regulations globally. This also includes maritime emissions, including GAG emissions. So our overarching legislation is called uh, Pollution Prevention Convention, MARPOL, and it's Annex 6 is the one that includes re regulations on uh, GAG emissions. We have a very specific frame. We are proud that IMO, unlike some of the other UN agencies, we are not uh, having soft legislation. We have hard legislation. So there's a very specific uh, mechanism, the way the states need to enforce our uh, legislation and, and the ships, as you can see, are being, being checked in different states that uh, the countries are actually, and the ships actually are implementing our regulations. Now, when it comes to climate change, Next to Marple Annex 6, uh, the biggest breakthrough in IMO was in 2018 um, when we adopted our initial uh, strategy, uh, which is now emission reduction strategy. Sorry for the for the typo. You can see that under this strategy, there are various instruments, regulations, standards. So this includes the Energy Efficiency Design uh, Index, which is for new ships, the Energy Efficiency for existing ships, the EXI, and the Carbon Intensity Indicator, um, as well as other uh, operational measures, how to uh, manage ships to also run more efficiently. We have a, a long-standing uh, history also and very much affects negotiations, researches on what type of decarboniz decarbonization technology sorry, are out there, what type of alternative fuels are out there that can support the maritime in its decarbonization journey. And this has been also very much uh, in the negotiations as quite a few countries have been arguing that we need more uh, knowledge and more understanding that how we can move, move ahead realistically to uh, decarbonize uh, shipping. Now, I, I would just have to say, because my presentation will focus on, on our support, uh, the implementation of, of the regulations, as well as our support to test technologies and to uh, also deploy technologies between developed and developing countries. But I just have to say that this year will be really important also for the regulatory framework. So we have been having long-standing discussions in IMO, which as I mentioned earlier, is leading on the climate change negotiations when it comes to maritime globally. So we are just reporting to it to the UNFCCC um, and we will be happy to report this this year too. So in our uh, MEPC, in our Environmental Committee, MEPC 80 in July, there will be very important discussions on the level of ambition of maritime decarbonization. So we are in the process of revising our strategy. 
There will be important discussions on so-called mid-term and long-term measures. These also include ideas on levy system or a cap and trade system, which could uh, enable uh, quite a big revenue to go to maritime decarbonization. And we are also going to revise um, a wide variety of our uh, instruments, the carbon intensity indicator, the data collection system, um, and we have also intensive work on the life cycle of alternative fuels. So there's a huge amount of uh, technical work which will um, is going on also in working groups, but which will lead to a very fruitful and very exciting discussion during the MEPC in July. So I would like to encourage all of you who are interested in maritime decarbonization to, to follow this. Now, next to the regulatory work, we are also helping uh, IMO member states to implement uh, the IMO regula regulations related to maritime decarbonization. Um, and also enable them to have discussions on some of the key issues, let it be technologies, let it be alternative fuels uh, or finance or connecting dif different uh, projects initiatives together. One of our oldest projects is called GMN, uh, which is an EU funded project. It established regional cooperation centers. We like to call them regional centers of excellence. And we have these regional <coughs> centers, uh, as you can see in the Pacific, in Asia, in Africa, uh, in Latin America <coughs> and in the Caribbean. And these centers uh, support us to uh, get the knowledge and the information from the countries in the region that what are their specific needs in their route to maritime decarbonization. Um, and they are also supporting us to provide tailor-made trainings um, and also to undertake pilots. You will see that the pilots is a general trend, so the countries are more and more interested not only in uh, traditional capacity building activities, but much more in piloting new technologies. I'm sorry. The Green Voyage project, which is a, a Norway finance project, is one of our flagship projects. It has been focusing on supporting legal policy reform in the participating developing countries and to develop so-called national action plans, which national action plans are supporting the countries in implementing the IMO GAG strategy and Marple Annex 6. Um, they, um, under this project, there has been quite a bit of progress also to demonstrate technological solutions. <clears throat> we have a, a big pilot ongoing now in India with the support of the World Bank also. And we are planning also technology demonstration pilots in South Africa and in Georgia. <laughs> We also have, I'm really sorry for this, we also have um, a specific uh, project where we are focusing on the needs of least developed countries and small island developing states. We have uh, uh, also linked here, here the MTCCs, so these regional uh, centers, but this is an annual training program for nominated seats and LDC participants supporting their knowledge on the GAG strategy. It's quite interesting that it's a one year program, so it's not um, one of, you know, just uh, sporadic trainings, which uh, we have been doing on the previous projects. And we are developing individual training plan for each and every participant, and we are following up afterwards on their needs. The aim of this project is really to train the future champions in LDCs and seats for maritime decarbonization. We have a project that uh, we are planning now together with, with Germany um, for the Asian region, where we are working together with PEMC. Um, we are going to address under this project not only maritime emissions, but also the whole maritime value chain. This is why we are also working with a regional partner there. And we are excited uh, for this project to start, which will again very much focus on the development in these countries of the uh, NAPs, so these national action plans, as well as to undertake technology pilots. 
Now, glow falling is not strictly related to um, to climate change, but I thought that I would mention that biofalling. So, uh, the biofalling guidelines of IMO, it has been sh showcased that uh, the implementation of the biofalling guidelines can uh, support quite a bit energy efficiency and savings, fuel savings, which of course has also a link to uh, managing and uh, minimizing GAG emissions. Test biofalling is a is a linked project also to glow falling. So here again, uh, you can see that there's a growing focus um, and interest from the countries, from the developing countries, not just in capacity building, but really in testing various technologies. This is also true for biofalling technologies. We also have a few uh, non-traditional projects, so I was interested to hear that in May you are uh, planning a webinar on finance. We also have our roundtables that we are uh, co-leading with the World Bank and the EVR, EBRD, and these roundtables are looking into innovative financial solutions uh, for maritime decarbonization. We are planning our next roundtable actually also in May, and we would like to showcase successful uh, investments in developing countries in maritime decarbonization to showcase how this happened, what are the best practices, um, and uh, how it, it, it can be mimicked in other countries too. In the previous roundtables, we already established quite a solid understanding of what are the needs and the challenges in investment in maritime decarbonization. So now they, we are moving into this next stage where we are <clears throat> hoping to, in a concrete manner, support uh, financing in maritime decarbonization. We also have a a project connecting the projects. Uh, we like to refer to it as the Google of maritime decarbonization. Uh, it's called NextGem. Um, you can <clears throat> filter by countries or different type of project, and you can see all the ongoing initiatives and, and projects that at least we are aware of. Uh, that are supporting maritime uh, decarbonization globally. Under NextGen, we also had a call recently for a route-based action uh, in the Asian region, um, and we are looking to uh, evaluate uh, the, 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 the call respondents and see if a new project can be supported there. Last but not least, we are also doing annual innovation forums together with UNEP. Here we are not so much looking solely at the technology needs of the maritime decarbonization, but also what type of models, innovation models are out there um, and how we can support uh, R&D deployment from uh, north to south and with a focus again on developing country LDCs and seeds needs. This actually led to the development of a new concept, which is called IMO CARES. Um, this concept we have just developed and we are looking now uh, for, for donors and we have already a very promising uh, negotiation with one donor. Uh, this would follow up on the technology deployment needs that were, that were so many times uh, highlighted by developing countries. And we would like to uh, establish a forum where we can have concrete matchmaking activities and also to, to look at the innovation needs and the innovation progress of maritime with a focus on decarbonization issues in an annual uh, manner. Thank you very much. I know it was a very quick um, uh, presentation, but I'm very happy to, to answer your questions. Um, thank you, Georgie, for sharing with us those insights. Uh, bunker fuels in particular are a significant challenge for the UAE, noting the centrality of the aviation and the uh, maritime transportation, so we appreciate your engagement. I'm particularly interested in the glow flow, the glow flow in terms of biodiversity as well, but we'll touch on that. Um, I'd like to invite our colleague from the uh, ICAO to engage with us. Uh, Neil, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, and thank you, and thank you for the invitation to be here today. I believe you can see my uh, see my screen. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure um, that I'm here to today to present the work of the International Civil Aviation Organization. Those of you not familiar. Uh, with ICAO. ICAO is the UN specialized agency 
um, set up in 1944 to deal with uh, all aspects of international civil aviation, including safety, uh, security, uh, and navigation economics, and of course, environmental protection. And environmental protection is what I'm here to talk to you about uh, today, and particularly addressing the impact of international aviation on the global climate. Um, so international aviation um, accounts for about 2% of global greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Now, this is due to, in part, long research cycles and long lifespan of aircraft, high cost of technology and strong resilience on fossil fuels. And all of that together means that I think, as we've heard today already, it is a hard to abate uh, sector. However, Thanks to the strong commitment of uh, ICAO member states, the 193 ICAO member states and industry players, things are evolving fast. Now, let me start by highlighting uh, the historic agreement reached by the International Civil Aviation Organization in October 2022, so very, very recently, where all ICAO member states agreed on a global long-term aspirational goal of net zero carbon emissions by 2050 in support of the Paris Agreement. Now, this commitment is a result of many years uh, of technical work that demonstrated the feasibility of reducing significantly in sector CO2 emissions by boosting the uptake of sustainable aviation fuels and low carbon fuels, and of course, other clean energies, optimizing air and ground operations, and deploying more efficient aircraft technologies. Now, this agreement on net zero is an essential milestone in the decarbonisation of aviation, which ICAO is now already working hard to start implementing, notably by supporting states and actively engaging with the financing community to stimulate investments to achieve the long term aspirational goal. Now, over the past uh, 15 to 20 years, ICAO has worked um, <clears throat> significantly to include many, many items on reducing the impact of aviation on the global climate. Now, I should actually say just a slight segue that, of course, ICAO's work is not only on global climate. For, for many, many years, all the way back to the dawn of aviation, uh, ICAO has worked on noise, local air quality, uh, and also global climate. Now, one important initiative to highlight uh, from a global climate perspective that was, for example, in 2017, aviation was also the first sector to agree to a global uh, standard for CO2 emissions for new and in production uh, aircraft types. Um, <clears throat> these standards are actually currently being uh, updated, so ICAO continues to update its standards moving, moving forward, and these ensure that the latest technologies are available on aeroplane types. Now, overall, you can see as part of our long term aspirational goal work, we took on board, on board all, all technologies. You can see new you, you can see on our website actually uh, uh, the full uh, the full overview of this uh, of this work. Uh, this involves operations in the air and on the ground. It in, involves all new types of airframe propulsion technology, including alternative energy sources. It includes drop in fuels, and by that I mean sustainable aviation fuels and low uh, low carbon fuels, or indeed brand new fuels such as uh, such as hydrogen uh, and uh, electrification. Now, all in all, all this means we need concrete means uh, of implementation. Um, I'd also like to uh, highlight uh, an area that we've been working intensely uh, on our carbon offsetting scheme uh, and our carbon offsetting and reduction scheme to reduce emissions for international aviation or Corsia. Now, in 2016, ICAO adopted this first global sectoral uh, scheme to reduce and offset emissions. And it has the objective to ensure carbon neutral growth of international aviation from 2020 onwards. Now, I'm happy to say uh, there are plenty of details here, but given the uh, given the time, I, uh, I'll encourage you to visit our, our, our website. Um, that actually this carbon offsetting scheme is now in full swing and its implementation is well on track. And this includes following the effects of the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, the 41st session of the ICAO Assembly also amended some design and el elements of Corsia to maintain the system's uh, integrity and indeed uh, the level of ambition. And I'm happy to say that 118 uh, states uh, have volunteered to participate uh, in the offsetting component uh, of Corsia. Um, another component of our, um, of our work 
uh, is co direct cooperation uh, with states, and we do this uh, we do this uh, a lot. Uh, this includes specific uh, specific projects uh, with states, but this is all wrapped together in our state action plan initiative. Now, this involves ICAO closely monitoring states' efforts to decarbonise their aviation markets, and to date. 136 states have voluntarily submitted their state action plans to ICAO. Uh, these state action plans will allow the latest innovations to be brought forward and will play a major role in the implementation uh, of the LTAG. And what you can see here is that actually those 136 uh, states represent, represent just a shade over 98% uh, of, global, of global traffic. Um, now, I've already mentioned uh, the what we refer to as the the basket of measures to decarbonize this uh, sector. This will be crucial, whether it's technology, operations or fuels uh, to deliver on the net zero 2050 commitment of the long term aspirational goal. Now, out of all of that, probably the biggest share is the deployment of sustainable aviation fuels, lower carbon fuels and other clean energies uh, uh, for transport. And this is one of the crucial pillars to reach net zero emissions by 2050. Now, later this year, ICAO states will convene the third conference on aviation alternative fuels, or what we refer to as CAF3. And one of the objectives will be to update uh, the 2050 ICAO vision uh, for, uh, for SAF. This will bring all stakeholders together to provide a a clear vision for this uh, for this important component of the sector uh, moving forward. Now, needless to say, sustainable aviation fuels uh, is one of the major technologies that will be used to deliver uh, the decarbonisation of the sector, and finance is now needed to bring forward these fuels in sufficient uh, in sufficient uh, quantities. Uh, you'll see that the technology here is ready, and what you see on the slide in front of you is actually uh, an important initiative called. Uh, called ACT, uh, ACT SAF, and I'll go through that a little bit with you now. This goes back to actually June 2022, and under the um, auspices of Stockholm Plus 50, so the 50th anniversary of sustainability, we launched our ACT SAF initiative, Assistance, Capacity Building and Training for Sustainable Aviation Fuels, which will help states in developing their SAF and LCAF uh, markets. Now, what we're doing is multifaceted. It includes training. It includes feasibility studies on sustainable aviation fuels and LCAF. It also, um, it also includes liaising with various different groups of course ICAO member states, industry, NGO, financial and development institutions, of course academic and uh, educational institutions. Uh, the full range of, uh, of stakeholders is, uh, is there and are uh, involved. And ICAO coordinates efforts for example, to train national experts, so to try and increase the understanding of sustainable aviation fuels and connect with financing institutions to, to support the very necessary needed investments. And actually, I'm here today to call on all parties, states, industries and actors uh, to really join this important, uh, this important effort. Um, I'll wrap up very, very quickly. Uh, I also like to highlight that ICAO also um, monitors um, the latest uh, the latest innovations, and we're doing this through our um, through our global uh, sustainable aviation coalition and our stock taking process. And I'm happy to say that we'll have another ICAO stock taking. You can see all the information on the ICAO stock taking, which brings to brings together all the innovations to the sector. We'll have another one this year in 2023 in the lead up to CAF. Uh, we encourage it all of you to consider joining the Sustainable Aviation Coalition. Um, it really is a, 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 an overall house where you can really informally share the latest innovations even before you've announced them or we can announce them all together. Uh, this stock taking exercise is also enable, enabled by a comprehensive set of tools uh, and policy agreements. Um, it also includes a, a full set of tracker, of tracker tools on technology operations and fuels. Now, finally, well, as I wrap up, I'd just like to highlight that everything I've said here and an awful lot more going outside of climate change too can be found in this comprehensive summary on our website. It's the ICAO Environmental Report 2022. Um, you can click the link here and or click the QR code. Uh, now, finally, the decarbonisation of this sector is crucial. Uh, it's a crucial undertaking that's shaping the future. 
States like the UAE are among the most uh, active participants in supporting action at, ICAO, uh, at the ICAO level, for which we are of course very, very grateful. The key to deliver on, on our long-term aspirational goal will be joint action by all policymakers and industry actors. And I'm optimistic that ICAO and the UAE will continue this excellent cooperation in the period leading up to COP28 and for the many years to come. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Neil, for sharing that uh, exciting development. It's good to see a strong coalition coming in support of this work. Um, last but not least, we have our fantastic colleague Ivana from Emirates Global Aluminium to share with us the reflections. Ivana, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And uh, a very nice to have uh, so many hard to abate sectors uh, talking alongside. Um, Emirates Global Aluminium, um, is quite uh, a relevant player uh, of the decarbonization, decarbonization pathway simply because aluminum is infinitely recyclable and as such it makes it uh, a key component of uh, circularity and uh, moving forward. Emirates Global Aluminium per se <coughs> is uh, the world's largest premium aluminum producer, roughly uh, one ton in every 25 is produced here in the UAE. Uh, uh, and this is one ton globally is produced here in the UAE. Uh, and we are uh, uh, at the forefront of decarbonization as we try to pursue a commercial resilience uh, strategy while retaining a leadership role uh, within the industry itself. Uh, we are vertically integrated, so from mining to uh, end users, uh, and we try to work very collaboratively uh, with the industries that uh, are keen to uh, decarbonize as well. And just as uh, Rana uh, uh, suggested before, we are part of the First Movers Coalition, which aims towards creating this initial impetus, this initial impact uh, towards the use of uh, low carbon metals, in our case, low carbon aluminum. We focus on uh, these uh, key industries, and these are also very end user oriented, which makes it easier to, um, to get uh, a closer uh, link to the, uh, to the demand for greener products. On top of that, there are key specific industries which have uh, a high growth uh, forecast in the lead to 2030 and obviously uh, forward, uh, and this being electric vehicle production, uh, solar PV and offshore wind. Uh, all these are large demand pools for aluminum per se, but green aluminum in compliance to international legislation. And this is where uh, some of these key requirements for financing uh, come into play. And the reason I'm sitting here within uh, uh, EGA as well. So if we take a quick glimpse at the global landscape, uh, for starting from Europe, the carbon border adjustment mechanism uh, has had a cascading effect on establishing carbon markets or carbon uh, market-based mechanism uh, across the world. The reason being, if you do want to import your metal into Europe, you need to disclose and align to the cost of uh, uh, the European ETS through this new piece of legislation. Now, in simple terms, I could write a check or I could actually use uh, this uh, uh, financial liability as an investment vehicle to decarbonize the industry and mature technologies, which today might not be commercially viable. This is if you assume that I left to pay at least 10, 20, 30 years of such fees, it's easy for us to look at how to streamline an investment vehicle based on the net present value of the cost of compliance. After Europe, the US is also looking at CBAM, and there is obviously other uh, uh, determining factors across the world pushing towards green and aluminum. But where is it that aluminum as an industry stands? Well, if we look at this graph, EGA is roughly in the middle. We have uh, uh, predominantly gas uh, fire power plants. To the left, 
you have a lot of smelters which have access to hydropower or renewables. And to the right, uh, you have coal fired predominantly in China, uh, many in India as well. So to mitigate these uh, uh, emissions, we have to look at how aluminum is produced. And for us, the vast majority comes from uh, the energy requirement. Aluminum is energy intensive. And for us, being able to decarbonize the power uh, helps us produce uh, uh, a low carbon uh, metal to start with. Uh, this does not mean that we are not looking at refinery, raw materials, smelter, and so forth, so on. Uh, but in many of these areas, technology is not yet available to decarbonize other than carbon capture and storage or utilization. Our path moving forward is very simple. We are currently decarbonizing our energy uh, source. We are decoupling it from the process emission so that we can, in, uh, we can purchase more renewable and more clean power for our uh, uh, metal. We will then move on to the uh, associated processes and the refinery itself. There is very little emissions coming from the mining side, but we try to pursue nevertheless uh, uh, best in class uh, um, processes to ensure that we do not, not only look at carbon emission, but meet the highest standards of uh, uh, ESG compliance from industry associations. Last and not least, we will have to address what is not yet possible to decarbonize, which is uh, PFCs coming from the process emissions. And this will come from a mix of uh, ITMOs, internationally transferable mitigating options, as well as uh, uh, carbon capture and utilization or storage, depending on what makes more uh, uh, sense at the time. One of our quick wins has been uh, manufacturing uh, aluminum using solar power. Uh, this first uh, batch was sold to BMW. Uh, pretty much every electric BMW on the road uh, currently uses Celestial uh, within uh, uh, its manufacturing process. But we're moving on to many other tier one uh, uh, automotive uh, uh, players. We also have uh, started uh, to um, create a specific product related to recycling. Uh, this is obviously uh, a win-win uh, because it only takes 5% of the energy to generate uh, recycled aluminum. The problem, the bottleneck for recycled aluminum is getting access to the, uh, to the scrap, to the post-consumer uh, uh, scrap which is very hard to aggregate and to put together, despite what we can think. Uh, aluminum is very light and the easiest one is cans, but there is a lot more aluminum out there that uh, meets the eye. And with that in mind, I thank everybody, my colleague especially, uh, and uh, specifically also the uh, what was raised before in terms of uh, uh, generating financing mechanism. Uh, related to the fact that we are looking at ways to uh, facilitate the maturity of carbon capture and hydrogen, as a quick example, uh, by leveraging carbon markets and access to finance uh, this early in the game. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ivano. I understand that you have to run for a different meeting. Right, you're on mute. You're on mute, Ivano. OK, fantastic. Right, so uh, colleagues, we've come to the end of our session. I think one important reflection that we have to take away also looking at the question that was posed is on the regulatory framework. The key issue for us in the multilateral system and the United Nations working with the UNFCCC and other partners is that the principle of polluter pays need to be activated in a more realistic manner. We know, for instance, that the uh, the EU's fifth tool for 55, what Ivana mentioned in relation to environmental provisions and trade, what was mentioned with UNIDO and other partners, 
on the uh, accounting for the emissions that were generated as a result of capitalizing on a service of uh, aviation, uh, maritime transport, but also other, other industrial processes, there has to be a mechanism for us to cost that element. And therefore, if we are going to make significant advances toward decarbonization, then the principle of polluter pays has to be taken into account. And chances are that will make uh, greener or more environmentally responsible product producers and products more competitive than others which are not. I, I see one question perhaps for our colleague uh, Neil on the uh, upcoming ECAO Vision 3 conference, if you can share with us an insight on that timeline or not, or sometimes these things can take some, uh, uh, those uh, dates need to be decided in due course. But the key element perhaps if you would like to touch on for, for future sessions is on how do we uh, measure progress and how do we adopt science-based targets in, in measurement of progress along these lines. And we will also have a further discussion along these lines as we look at the IPCC's work, the global stock take and, uh, and results that, uh, that go beyond that. So Neil, if you have anything to add, otherwise we can close. Yeah, I can add a, I can add a few, a few points uh, here. Yeah, this is a big year. Um, well, every year is a big, a big year here at Ikea, but the, uh, but this is a big, uh, this is a big year, particularly focused on the on these uh, sustainable aviation fuels and low carbon uh, fuels. The conference uh, itself, which is decision making uh, conference, will be towards the end of this year, and, and as you've highlighted, the kind of timelines. Uh, um, that we're working on um, uh, are being decided uh, now with a whole slew of events leading up to the end of the year and that uh, and that decision making event. I would add also that from a technical perspective, um, this will of course in, uh, include the uh, items such as the encouragement in the development of sustainable aviation fuels, as I've uh, indicated, uh, as I've indicated, the, uh, the technology is ready. This is now about scaling this is about scaling. Um, everybody can be uh, everybody can be involved in this uh, in this process. Uh, all ICAO member states are really moving forward in unison uh, on on this. So this includes those with maybe more traditional refining type uh, industries to those that don't have that type of refining industry. It's all dependent on feedstock availability. Of course, maintaining clear sustainability uh, clear sustainability criteria. And last thing I would say, it will also be about coming together to try and properly monitor and report um, the use of all technology, all operations, and of course, as we've as I've just indicated here, uh, fuels um, in a very clear and coherent uh, manner. So um, happy to continue talking, and and please everyone pay attention to what's happening here in in Montreal and the global community. Uh, this will be a, a very important year for the implementation of a long term aspirational goal, Net Zero 2050. Well, th thank you, Neil. I think we have a lot of work ahead of us uh, toward COP28, beyond COP28, and towards saving our planet. Well, with that, thank you all for being with us. Be with us also next week, same time, same place, different link, to discuss the topic of health and uh, climate action. And we'll invite you to register for the upcoming session with interesting discussions from WHO and other partners along these lines. Thank you, colleagues, for being with us. Looking forward to your uh, enge continued engagement, and uh, see you around. Thank you. Thanks.